see. All right. Um, so good morning, oh, close to good afternoon, but good morning, everyone. Um, I know I'm the, the only thing standing between you guys and some lunch, so <laughs> we will hopefully make this a bit, uh, a bit quicker, a bit nicer. It's going to be roughly 20 to 30 minutes, and we got a little bit of demos at the end. Um, so let's get straight to it. Hacking service architectures, right? Uh, before that, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm from Singapore. That's the email. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in that repo. I haven't posted up yet. I'll do it at the end of this talk, but you know, everything, the slide deck, the, the Terraform scripts, serverless scripts, et cetera, they're all gonna be there for you to be able to spin up. And then if you want to sort of replicate the demo in, in your own environments, that, that'll be cool as well. But um, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today, right? So let's talk about the agenda. So the first thing we wanna talk about is what is serverless, right? Because serverless is this huge buzzwordy term. Uh, um, and, and if you ask 100 different people, they'll have 100 different answers for you. I'm going to tell you at least what I think serverless is in, in the context of today's discussion, um, because serverless is a very wide topic, right? It doesn't just cover only the, the fast stuff, the functions as a service stuff. It covers a lot of other things. But we will dive very deeply or a bit deeply into Lambda functions. Lambda functions are the functions as a service, which is the compute aspect of serverless offered by AWS. So um, AWS have Lambda. Uh, one of the first functions as a service. You've got other stuff as well. So if you're doing GCP, there's the uh, Google Cloud functions, there's Google Cloud Run as well. If you're in Azure, there's Azure functions, there's a whole bunch of things like Cloudflare workers. I think even Tencent have their own stuff. Um, so today's talk is going to be very AWS specific, but there are some elements of this that you can use in, in other places as well. Now, after we talk about Lambda functions, we're going to talk very specifically about the credentials of a Lambda function. Um, and this is the most interesting thing of all because, um, you know, Compromising a, a VM or compromising a container is one thing, and maybe you want to get RC on that one. But for Lambda functions, they are a very, very low privilege environment, and they usually have very, very low amounts of you know, compute and, and resources, and they're usually meant to do only one thing. And so the, the real uh, sort of gem, if you like, in a Lambda function is not the, the function itself. It's not trying to get RC on the container. It's trying to actually extra, exfiltrate out the credential. The credential is the most important thing in the function. And if you can, as an attacker, what you really want is the credentials inside, the, the actual AWS access keys inside these Lambda functions, which is what we'll show in the demo, how we might exfiltrate them out and reuse them in other places. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap it up with some detection and mitigation, right? So that's roughly the sort of outline of the talk. Um, I try to make this as, as, as inclusive as possible. So we do try to cover it broad, but at some points we might go into some more very specific serverless stuff uh, and let's hope we have some fun, right? So first off, what is serverless? Uh, well, no service. <laughs> well, what is a server, right? Is it this metal thing that you rack and stack in your data center, you know, the Dell R740 or whatever? Um, well, yeah, but that's a very, you know, very, very narrow definition of a server because you know, these things are servers as well, right? We call them, uh, Tomcat, Nginx, Apache, Caddy, whatever, right? They call web servers. And the web server's primary job is to, you know, open up a socket 24-7 as users send in HTTP requests and grab data out of that request and pass it on to the application server. Again, another server. That application server is your, is your developer's custom code. They're writing it down, but they're using some runtime, right? So Java developers use JVM, Python developers use Python, you know, so on and so forth that runtime runs on an operating system, all of that encapsulated into a server. And finally, that application might talk to a database, right? And that's again, a database server. That database has a engine, you know, Postgres, MySQL, uh, um, and all of that again runs on an operating system. All of these three things are servers, right? And this is a traditional, you know, we've seen this a hundred times, tree tier architecture, web server, app server, database server. How does this look like in a serverless environment, all right? And so let's take it apart one at a time and see what we can do. So within AWS, at least, there are some services where we can actually get rid of web server. So we no longer are um, worried about you know, keeping a process up 24 seven on our web servers, patching those Apache things, you know, the dark art of Apache configuration and making sure everything's secure, it's really tough. Uh, so AWS offer API gateway and they offer AppSync and one's GraphQL, one's REST API base. Um, to do this for you. Basically, it does exactly what it, it says. It basically, it will host up that socket. It will accept the connection. It will take out the bits and pieces of the request that is required, and it passes them on to your app server. And now you've got one less OS to manage, one less thing to, to worry about. It's run for you as a service. This is why people really love serverless. Well, what about the application? It's still got service at the application server. And this is where we talk about our real you know, star of the show here. It's Lambda. Uh, and, and in Lambda, basically what you can do very simply today, you can log on to the AWS console, literally on the console, and you can go to Lambda, 
and you can type code in, right? JavaScript, Python, as long as it's a scripted language, it should be fine. And you can actually execute code on the cloud from the console, right? Seconds, instantly, no problem, right? Uh, you don't have to generate, you don't have to spin up a VM, you know, get the IP of the VM, get the SSH key pair, log on to the VM, try, you know, dump the code there and then run it. You can run it directly from the console. Basically what you do, very simple, is you send AWS some code and say, AWS, here's some Python code, please run it in a Python container of this size and it'll run. AWS will run it for you. And then you've got less things to manage. You're not managing the runtime, you're not managing the operating system. Again, this is why people are gravitating towards serverless a lot. And finally, you have the database. Uh, and within the database, there are some you know, serverless databases, uh, DynamoDB being the most popular. It's not only a key value pair. People think it's just a key value pair. You can actually run a full-blown application on it. Granted, it's no SQL, so there's a lot of work to do there. But in theory, you could do everything like this. Basically, you've eliminated the operating system. As, a, as your developers look at this, there's no operating system to do, which you know, means that there's nothing to patch. There's no OS to patch. Spectre and Meltdown really have no impact on this kind of architecture. You don't worry about it, right? Um, and this is why I think a lot, as we move over the next three to five years, people are going to move to this, right? The initial picture I showed you was quite simple. It didn't include all the other stuff. If you were running in containers on a container platform with orchestration, et cetera, you know, there's a lot more labor extraction that you manage. Whereas with this, this is basically the picture that you run if you choose a, let's say, a purely serverless architecture. But let's, let, let's dive a little deeper into, into Lambda. Lambda is the real star of the show. And I can talk for, <laughs> about Lambda for days. But uh, for the purposes of today, where we want to try and see you know, where the credentials are on the Lambda, how the Lambda works, et cetera, there's two very important pieces we want to talk about with Lambda. And that's first, it's, it's event-driven nature and how does Lambda interact with other AWS services? When you spin up a Lambda function, how does it integrate and interact with other AWS services to really get the full benefit of Lambda as you do with traditional serverless architecture, right? So first things first, event-driven. What, what does event-driven mean? Okay, well, you start off with a Lambda function. Now you can deploy Lambda functions all day long. You can deploy hundreds of them, but all that code that you deploy into AWS isn't really put into any process that runs it. The code's not running, it's just you know, dormant. It's just your code or some uh, artifact, some jar or whatever, that's just dormant waiting to run. The thing that actually pops it into existence that causes it to, to run is an event. An event happens and then the Lambda runs. Then your code gets downloaded into a process and then it runs. That event can be many things. It could be you know, something hitting a queue. It could be a file into an S3 bucket. It could be uh, an API request into API gateway. It could be a new record into DynamoDB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of integrations that trigger the Lambda to run. The, the key thing is that that code that you deployed, it doesn't really run until the event happens. The event is what triggers the Lambda to basically pop into existence. Once the Lambda pops into existence, you know, it can get some input data from somewhere else and it can get it from anywhere, you know, from the internet or from other AWS sources. And it can put some output data, again, it can put it to anywhere uh, or some other AWS sources as well. Now, after it's done its job, you know, it, it's, there's a Lambda function, it's a real function. You give it some input, it gives you some output. After it runs its job, the Lambda dies, right? And, and we'll talk about a bit about what actually dying means. Uh, and, but shortly after this, it's locked out. So this is basically now that the process that ran is no longer running. It's, it's no longer consuming any CPU. It's just dormant for a while. It's a warm dormancy, right? There's a couple of things important to understand is that first of all, all of this basically runs over the network. It's like a moat of network around this Lambda function and it connects over the network interface. Um, recently, AWS have some capability of attaching EFS to this thing, but you know, generally speaking, it's all network connectivity. And the Lambda function has no SSH access. It's not like a container or a VM. You have no SSH access to the Lambda. You can, you know, if you want to, uh, dump a reverse shell into this thing and, and try to play around with it. And there's some great resources for that. But in general, they expose no ports. So two Lambda functions in the same network, you know, you have no connectivity between them through the network because they, they expose nothing. There's no port to, to connect into. Um, so that's one important piece. The second one is how does that, when the Lambda function dies, what do we mean by, by dying? All right. Uh, and, and there's two bits here. So if you call a Lambda, if you call two Lambda functions concurrently, right, the same function, like, you know, two API requests came in at exactly the same time, AWS will spin up two processes to uh, process those requests independently. 
So it's the same function, the same code, but they are on two different, what we call execution contexts or containers, right? And each of them are independent of each other, processing each of those individual requests, and then they give back the data. If you call them sequentially, one, and then gets the response, and then the other, AWS will reuse that same container again, because you know it's already spin up the container, it's not gonna throw it away if the next request is coming down. But if you look deeper into what this actually means, right? And, it, and you know, it gets a bit deep, but you know, it, it's important to understand this because this is where we can understand all of the credential stuff. It's like, okay, so a Lambda is invoked and you know, AWS looks around and says, is there any execution context for this particular function? If there isn't, it goes to something called a cold start. And this is exactly what it sounds like. You, it gets your code, loads it in a container, you know, runs some uh, associate execution environment, executes your initialization code, et cetera, and only then will it actually pass in the handler, it will, it will the handler with the data. So if the API uh, request came in, that API request is only processed during the invoke handler part of this page, only then, right? On the next sequential request, you get something called a warm start. It basically bypasses that cold start bit and goes into a warm start. This is why the first time you spin up a Lambda function, it might be a little bit slower, not much, you know, anywhere from 100 to maybe 300 milliseconds, but the second time is gonna be much faster. Okay, so that's roughly how Lambda's event-driven architecture is. That's what, what it means with Lambda. The second part is how does Lambda interact with other AWS services? Um, and the short answer is just like anything else, right? Inside a Lambda function, if you wrote it in Python, for example, it would use the Boto3 SDK, and that call to AWS services is no different than a call to AWS service running on your local machine or running from a VM or running from an EC2, et cetera. No different. It uses the same thing. But we have to dive a little bit deeper here because um, there are differences, right? So there's a difference between a data plane and a control plane. So if you consider a traditional uh, VM, right? Uh, to create the VM, EC2 start instance, boom. That's a call you make to the AWS API. AWS spins up that uh, the VM for you, gives it to you. And now if you want to do anything with the VM, you perform a data plane operation. As I said, your RDP into the box and you do whatever you want with that box, right? These are two separate planes of access, but they're also two separate physical planes, if that makes sense. So you're using two different parts. So one's to the AWS API, one's directly to the VM's IP address. One uses your AWS credential, the other one uses whatever SSH key pair you had assigned to that box. And one is a REST API call, the other one's SSH or, or RDP. So that, that, that's the differentiation there. With serverless, it actually sort of brings these two things together. You still have data plane and control plane because that's like a logical construct, right? But they all operate on the same path, credentials and protocols. So for example, if you wanted to spin up a DynamoDB table, you know, DynamoDB, uh, create table, right? That's a call to the AWS API. If you wanted to get data from the DynamoDB table, that's also a call to the AWS API. They use the same path, AWS API. They use the same type of credentials. I like hopefully you don't use the exact same credential for both, but you know, it's all AWS credentials to create the table as well as to get data from the table or put data to the table or query the table. And it's the same protocol, right? And then it's all the same protocol that's running. Now, if you compare this, right, you compare this to what we had before. So imagine you've got uh, a VM in your environment, right? Um, and it's got some connectivity. So you're connecting to Kafka and Postgres and MinIO, and you're using this different bunch of protocols and not even the same credential, right? Because they're not even the same credential type. One's a two-way SSL, one's a password, one's some security token. And, and you have to worry about things like how do I generate these credentials, right? Uh, right amount of entropy. How do I inject them into that running process? How do I, you know, secure them so that they don't get exfiltrated? And, and how do I rotate them, which is really very tough. But in the world of, of Lambda and serverless, it actually is quite straightforward, right? Because you just say, hey, Lambda, this function should have these permissions and these roles. And the platform, AWS, take care of injecting the credentials, generating these credentials and putting it in. And the sort of recycling of the rotation of this happens because the Lambda eventually dies anyway, and it's a temporary credential. So your developers are thinking not along credentials, they're not thinking about, do I get the database password? They're thinking along permissions and policies, right? They're thinking about, all right, you know, this function has to have some permission to put some objects in this bucket, to read some data from this table, and, and to do something else, right? And they're thinking of permissions, and then the platform takes care of credentials. But if you wanted to sort of understand how does the, how does the credential get accessed? Because if we say that, well, 
you know, lambda function, the credential is the most important thing. Um, it would be kind of nice for us to understand where those credentials are and how those credentials get generated. Well, it turns out, uh, and this is because sometimes you do a little bit of reverse engineering, somewhere in that cold start process, somewhere in that cold start, a call is made to AWS SDS, which is the security token service, to get a temporary set of credentials for the role that you assign to the Lambda and inject it into the Lambda function, right? Um, and, and specifically, it's injected into the environment variables. Remember, we said that AWS interact, uh, Lambda interacts with all the services the same way anything else interacts. Um, in this particular case, what it means is that, you know, your, your AWS SDK, right? It, whenever, whatever SDK you use, Java or Python or Ruby or, you know, Rust, whatever, it looks for all credentials in three places, um, either the environment variables, um, the AWS credentials file, or the instance metadata service, if you use uh, EC2 so on. For Lambda, it's always just injected directly into the environment variables. So at the cold start of the process, the first time that function gets called, a temporary set of credentials is generated and injected into that process into the environment variable. So at least now we know, okay, so if you want to get the credentials, it's got to be in the environment variable. Uh, and if you look at the actual sort of cloud trail log of the thing that happens, um, you'll see this. You'll see that the, okay, so there's an assume role call. This is to get those credentials, right? Um, and they generate these Asia credentials, ASIA. Credentials starting with ASIA are the temporary ones. They, they have an expiration date next to them. The AKIA ones don't. But the, particularly for this example, this is an actual thing that I pulled out of CloudTrail, but you know, I, I, I uh, sort of suppressed a lot of stuff. Um, you can see the event time and the expiration date. The credentials themselves are always 12 hour credentials, right? They, they, they generate a temporary, but they last 12 hours. So the function can be purged. The function could still be running, doesn't matter. The credentials themselves separate from the function actually last, 20, well, actually last 12 hours. Um, why is this important? Because with that credential, you know, you can call anything that the function was permissioned to do. If the function was permissioned to read the DynamoDB, grab stuff from the S3 bucket, put some stuff into the event bridge, and you have the credential now, you can impersonate that function. Some of these services have resource-based policies, so they can limit and say that the credential itself is not enough. So for S3, for example, you might say, this S3 bucket can only be accessed from these particular VPCAs, et cetera. But most of these resources don't, and even when they do, it's, it's not very common to see very, very restrictive resource-based policies. So once you have the credential, you can actually sort of impersonate that function from anywhere else in the world and call these services to get the data, right? So if that function could query a DynamoDB table, you've got the credential, now you can query the DynamoDB table, right? So that's why, at least for, for Lambda and at least for serverless, it's keys over RCEs, man. Keys are the things that you really want. It's the access keys. Those are the credentials you want. Um, the RCE itself, unless the RCE is to get you that key, it's not that, you know, not that useful anymore. But um, where are those credentials? Like we said, they're injected into the environment variable. So if you really wanted it, all you have to do is, is dump the environment variables. Uh, and usually there's a lot of nice stuff in the environment variables to tell you about what's going on and find some way to exfiltrate that out of the account. Um, so here's very, very short little bit of Python code to do that. Basically, it dumps the environment variables and it posts that out to, a, to an API. Um, and and you, once that, whoever controls that API will be able to get those credentials and use them on their behalf. So that's roughly it. And we're going to see a little bit in the demo, right? Uh, so within the demo, it's going to look something like this. There's going to be two AWS accounts. There's going to be a victim account and an attacker account. Um, and I've compromised the victim's Lambda function. Um, in this particular case, I just compromised the package. And so, you know, it's pretty trivial because <laughs> I just dumped my own code into that package, but that's not the point. The point is, how do we get the credentials out? In the first demo, we'll see, well, I'll spin it out. The attacker will stand up an API. And well, the Lambda function, every time it runs, will just dump its credentials and post it out to this API. This is pretty straightforward stuff. So the way people mitigate around this thing is usually they put the Lambda function into a VPC. They you know, segregate it out over the network, right? But remember what we said, Lambda is surrounded by network. There's a moat of network around a Lambda function. If a Lambda function was in a network by itself, it's pretty useless. You know, all it is is some compute and not very powerful compute at that. And so typically what people do is even in a VPC, even within a VPC, a private VPC, there's always gotta be some sort of network connectivity back to AWS. For example, the Lambda needs to put something into an S3 bucket. It needs connectivity to the S3 API. Um, and the way we do that within the VPC is we stand up a VPC endpoint. So you say, this is the S3 VPC endpoint, and it allows this 
segregated, isolated network to connect back to S3. Now, it's not connecting back to you know, your S3. There's no such thing as your S3. Connecting back to the S3 public API or the, the S3 API, which means that it connects to everybody's S3. And from an attacker perspective, what we're going to do is we're going to run this VPC and post it into our S3 bucket using the Lambda function. So we use the S3 uh, endpoint as sort of like a portal to send data out into our S3 bucket. Um, this only works though if the Lambda function has, you know, overly permissive IAM rules. It's got to have put object and it's got to have put object ACL. Things have to be star permissions. So they have to be able to do everything else in order for this to work. It's not very common to see that. So the final example we're going to do is something called a bring your own credential attack, where we actually inject our own credentials as an attacker into the function and then use our credentials to exfiltrate the data out into a bucket we control again. Um, so that's the three, three sort of high level things we're going to do. And finally, at the end, uh, we're going to show you an example of using those credentials in a Lambda function on the attacker side to put some stuff into uh, the victim's bucket again, right? So let's, uh, let's dive straight into the demo. Let's see what we got here. Uh, can you guys see? Right. OK, so what we have here is, um, again, the victim on the left, attacker on the right, um, victims in this, uh, this blue thing here, uh, and the attackers in the red, in the red tabs, yeah? Um, so what I've done is actually the API is connected to a DynamoDB table. So everything, something hits the API, we're going to be able to get those credentials out. So the first thing we're going to run is victim API. So this is the first example. It's going to run the API. So this is a Lambda function. And like I said, you can actually go to console and execute Lambda from the console, and we're going to execute something. So, you know, it's got a little bit of um, the code does nothing much. It basically just randomly gets the bucket, puts a file into an S3 bucket in the victim account. But the package that's compromised is this evil Lambda cache, which supposed to cache uh, SSM parameters. But on top of that, what it does is it does the exfiltration of data as well. So if I run this execution, so I'm going to execute this Lambda function. Um, and yeah, cold start sometimes over the network takes a bit slow. Uh, all right, so the execution is successful. And we'll see actually what happens also. I print out the, uh, the access key ID in the log so you can see that. So this particular Lambda function has this particular access key. You know, ends with a 7xj. And so on the attacker side now, if I refresh my DynamoDB table, I'll see one um, function there. Because what happens is that the Lambda function in the victim's account posted their data to an API. The attacker took that data and dumped it into this DynamoDB table. You can see the function name, the access key. Um, if I click here, you can see all of the details are posted up. You got the session token, um, the key ID, etc. It's temporary. You can't use it anyway <laughs> if you wanted to try it, but yeah, you can try. But everything that I need to impersonate this function is already here, and I can do it already, right? So that's the first demo. Um, the second demo we're going to see is an S3 bucket, OK? So before I, I execute this function, I want to show you that it's actually inside a VPC. So it's in a VPC. And if I click on that VPC, open it up just to show you that it's, it's actually segregated from the internet. There is no internet connectivity here. Um, what am I going to do? OK, so I'll just show you that there are no internet gateways on the account. There is no egress only internet gateway in the account either. So there's no internet access available to this function. Um, so what we're going to do again, go back to the function. We're going to run that again. Um, it will succeed. And again, this has got a new key ID over here, Asia, and it ends with a 2QS. And if I refresh my DynamoDB table on the attacker side, um, it's there. This is where we use the VPC endpoint to push data to our bucket. Within the attacker side, you can see you will have find one file in this bucket now, right? And that's the creds that came to us via. So basically dumped into a bucket, a function on the attacker side, took it from the bucket, put it into DynamoDB table. Now we've got two credentials from two the functions here. OK, but the thing is that, uh, like I said, this one, so hold on, give me one minute. Here we go, permissions. I'm not very used to the, to the console. <laughs> uh, here we go. So within the, this Lambda function, I had to give it, in order for this thing to work, I had to give it this particular permission. It's a very, very wide scope permission. Put object, put object ACL on our, right? Um, it's very rare you find something like that. But you know, in order for this particular attack to work, I have to do this. If this wasn't there in the Lambda function, then I have to actually bring my own credentials, which is the third, um, which is the third demo we're going to show. So let's do that. Go out here. OK, so this is bring your own credential Lambda function. So this Lambda function, uh, let's go down a bit. 
again, it's in the VPC. So this account, no internet um, gateway, no egress into the gateway, no internet access on the VPC. Um, and also, uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, here we go, permissions. Uh, let's view the role document. There is no, you know, star permission here. There is a put object permission, but it's scoped down to a very specific bucket. So that's okay, right? There is no, you know, put object to put object ACL here. If I run this permission, so I'm going to test that out, and now it's running that thing. Uh, again, we can see that key ID right there. So it ends with a 307. And if I refresh it here, you'll see it's a 307 right there. And so what's happened is that actually we've exfiltrated out, we've used our own credential in this, um, in this Lambda function to exfiltrate data out through the VPC endpoint to our account. And now uh, from the attacker's point of view, I have three credentials here, three sets of credentials for three Lambda functions that I can use. Um, so the final, final demo is actually using those credentials. And for that, we go to the uh, attacker. Here we can use the use creds function, right? Um, and if you look at this function code here, so I don't know if you guys can see very clearly, but you know, I grabbed the data from the DynamoDB table that I got right now. I use that to create uh, an attack client with those credentials. And then I'll just put an object into the bucket. Um, you might ask, well, how, how would you know which, what's the bucket name to put the object into? Um, well, it turns out the environment variables are used not just to store credentials. A lot of um, development teams will use the environment variables to store things like the bucket name or the DynamoDB name for that particular function, right? So we use the environment variables as we move from, you know, our test environment to the dev environment to the production environment. And each of those uh, different environments and different functions have different environment variables. So dumping all the environment variables actually give us a lot of information about the function. Um, right. So just to make sure, so let's go to this management console here. I'll, I'll refresh that as some files there. And just to make sure that I'm really executing this from the attackers, I'm going to just, you know, mash up my keyboard over there. I'm going to deploy this new function with that new mashup. So DS something, something BW. Test it out from here. Um, right, so it's executed. And on the victim side, I can run, and you can see that, you know, I, from the attacker side now, I've used those credentials to put something into a bucket belonging to the victim. I could also use it to grab data out of the victim bucket and do all of those stuff. And this is why the credentials themselves are actually the, the most important part of a, of a Lambda function, right? So yeah, that, that's the demo. Um, let's quickly go back to Keynote. Uh, let's see what it is. Ah, detection, right? So detection, admit, so how would you detect if someone is using a credential. Um, it turns out that at least within Lambda, um, there is a tight affinity between the function IP address and the credential. Once a credential, the cold start process, right? Remember it's a cold start process, they grab the credentials, they put it in, and then that container has those credentials for the lifetime of the container. But that container also has a tight affinity to an IP address, and it's always gonna have the same IP address. And therefore, if you see a same credential ID, the same you know, key ID being used across multiple IP addresses, you sort of know that someone has used those credentials, exfiltrated them out and used it because a credential should always be tied to one and only one IP if deployed in a you know, public stuff. If you deploy it into a VPC, then you, know, you can also see the source VPCE. You, know, you expect to have that source uh, VPCE to be the same regardless of where it is. Once you see a credential being used outside of the VPC, again, you can sort of know that that's um, it's being used. It detects for some calls, of course, not everything is logged, but you can detect it. Um, so what you really want to do in terms of mitigation detection, so if you have a VPC endpoint, you can actually put policies on the endpoint to prevent the exfiltration of data. You can put a policy on the endpoint to, to not make it so permissible, but actually scope it down to maybe your account or you know, uh, particular parts. Um, easier said than done, but it's a possible thing to do. Secure software supply chain. Obviously, once we go to serverless, supply chains are more important than ever because that's where you probably get most of the, the issues. Um, and again, like I said, to detect when IP credentials being used, you have an affinity to the IP address and scope down IAM rules. Scope down IAM rules, again, easier said than done. It's pretty hard to, to, to write good, you know, well-formed IAM policies for accounts. With Lambda functions, you have the ability to assign each function its own IAM rule. And so uh, an API may have 30 endpoints and those 30 endpoints translate to 30 Lambda functions. Each Lambda function can have its own IAM rule. It's very secure, but it's also a bit tedious to write and may not be very practical, but you can do that. Whereas typically what you have is, you know, within the VM or within the container, that container hosts the whole API. And therefore, if it has 30 endpoints, it will have super permissions basically for all 30 endpoints. And so compromising that one container means you basically get as many permissions as possible. 
Whereas with the functions, if you scope down each to its own role, uh, a compromise function can only release permissions for that particular function. And so that allows us to scope it down. Again, easier said than done, but it has that, that possibility of doing it at least. Here's an example of an assume role. You can see that there is an API, um, a source API as well as a VPC endpoint. And once you have the VPC endpoint, you know that if a function has been assumed role for VPC endpoint, it will always have that same VPC endpoint, right? Um, but, <laughs> uh, and then finally, this is the but. Um, what we discussed today is all like, you know, highly theoretical. There's some evidence this is going on, but you know, not much. Um, my personal experience and my personal opinion is that serverless is a much better starting point than anything else, right? It's always patched infrastructure at the bottom. So, you know, that's one less headache to do. You know, you don't have to manage OS patching anywhere in this diagram. Just like, you know, you own an S3 bucket. That's obviously running on some server, but you're not worried about patching that particular server, right? It's provided to you by the cloud provider. Um, the functions, like you see, have temporary tokens and they issue for 12 hours, right? And, and most API calls are long, not all, but most. Um, you know, that's a pretty high benchmark of maturity, right? How many, how many organizations, you know, really have that kind of 12 hour temporary token protection? If you were had a VM connecting to a database, you know, how many people can, you know, hand to heart say, we will take those credentials every 12 hours. It's very, very rare. Um, it's a zero trust network. It's all, um, all API calls are authenticated and encrypted. And like we said, the individual functions can be scroped down. So um, you don't get monolithic, big, big, you know, fat chunks of IAM permissions. You get small chunks of IAM permissions and you have a really strong defense so that each particular function, even if it's compromised, will only give up, the, will only give up permissions for the stuff that it was allowed to do. Um, and finally, the functions themselves, they run in sandboxes and they expose no network interface. Again, very good as well. Um, and, and yeah, I think in general, this is where people are gonna go with serverless over the next you know, two to three years. Um, and a lot more, you're gonna see a lot more stuff built on Lambda function. You're gonna see a lot more full-blown applications written using only these kind of functionalities, only serverless services, because they actually reduce a lot of load on all the operations and manual tasks you have to do. And, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I end my talk. So thanks for All right.